And then I'm going to turn it over and stop recording, but I'm going to turn it over to Shirley to offer the opening blessing. Here's one for and thank you, everyone. Okay, and here's a map of the PTPC network. And then these are disclaimer slides. And we just read that the National American Indian Alaska Native Prevention Technology Transfer Center is supported by a grant from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, SAMHSA. The content of this event is the creation of the presenters and opinions expressed do not necessarily reflect the views or policies of SAMHSA, HHS, or the American Indian Alaska Native PTTC. And then there will be a follow-up email sent out afterwards and a survey posted about an hour into the presentation if you would like to participate it, um, and request certificates of attendance. There will be links to the presentation slides and recordings um, sent out in the follow-up email as well. And then we would like to take this time for a land acknowledgement. So if you would like to take some time to read this silently. This was created by members of our team, Ella Driscoll, Keely Driscoll, and Sean Baer from the Squawk Nations. And then we'd love to introduce our presenters. We have Lizzie Moore, who's presenting, expected to receive her master's in public health this August. And then we also have Daniel Luna, who's a community outreach specialist for the Europe Tribal Court. And I believe I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that someone else can begin sharing theirs as well. Thanks, Parker. Um, yeah, this is Lizzie, and I'm going to just share my screen here. Okay. Okay, can you can you all see that? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Um, I turned off my recording because I think it'll just be easier for me um, to uh, to be here without me being <laughs> my video being videoed while I'm doing that. Um, and if I could ask if there are comments or if there's any um, reason that I need to pause, please feel free to you know call that out. Um, I also wanted to, so I wanted to acknowledge I'm Lizzie and then Daniel Norton Luna is here with me to present. And then we also have Holly Stram, who is the Yurok Public Health Officer, who's listening on the call. Um, and I don't think Lori Nesbitt is here, but she's our opioid program manager of the Yurok Tribal Court. Um, Lori is Daniel's boss and Holly is my boss and they were gonna um, come on to listen. Um, the latter part of our presentation is about spe a specific data process um, or actually multiple processes that the Yurok tribe has been doing and, and it's being shared with permission from our tribal council. The, the first half is meant to paint a picture of the general data landscape that many tribes face. Um, I'm not sure how immersed in this you all, all, all are already, um, so I hope it's not redundant for you. I do want to give a disclaimer that I have a lot of background with data collection, but I have only been working with the tribe for about six months, um, and it's with my internship. And so this is the first time I've focused specifically on tribal data. Um, so the first part is me really humbly sharing what I've learned. Um, and Daniel and, um, and Holly and Lori, you know, have been working with all of this for longer, um, so they might have more insight. But I saw this saying that you'll see here on the screen, and um, it's a bumper sticker that I saw in college, and then I found it online, and it says the world is run by people who show up. So I guess that all of us on this call are the ones who are showing up today for this webinar, and so that's what we're going with. Um, and all that is to say is that the purpose of this presentation is not to show up as experts, but to just share resources and experience and thinking. Um, so before I jump in. Daniel, do you have anything to add? No, that sounds great. I love the way you're starting this. <laughs> oh, good. Okay, <laughs> great. Okay, 
So a brief overview about what to expect is I'm first going to present what we know about data collection for ind indigenous tribes in general, and then some general points about data collection and tracking. And that takes about 25 minutes. And so I, I will pause um, at that point and ask if we want to have a bit of discussion before going into the second half. We don't have to stop, but we you know can if we choose to. Um, and then again, like I said, the second half is about recent data collection projects that the Yurok tribe has has done. Um, and then you guys can all go into breakout rooms and brainstorm what you hear and how you might um, bring it back to your locations. And then we'll have some questions and answers at the end. Um, so if that sounds OK, I will just dig in. So first of all, um, let's talk about why we need data. Um, we know we need it for getting grants. Uh, we know we need it for grant reporting, certification, and evaluation. Um, we also need it to understand our current state and our processes, our systems, our efforts, and our progress. And we also need it, um, or it can be used, to understand the lived experience of people who are here, we're here to support. There is something called community-based participatory research, which I'm gonna describe a little bit more, um, and that can actually help build community. Equally as important, data is a real resource. So having robust data, which includes having access and control of it, is about having data sovereignty. And this is a quote on the right from the Urban Indian Health Institute that says, in order to conduct indeed indigenous epidemiology, we must honor and uphold tribes inherent right to govern their people, lands, resources, and data. So um, over the last decade in my previous career, I helped build a cancer support program that served any cancer patient and their family in my community, which was in the uh, Santa Rosa area. Um, and it, so it didn't help just those people getting treatment within our healthcare system. And it was all uh, psychosocial support. We had support groups and a peer counseling program and classes and presentations and equine therapy and overnight retreats and a pretty neat nurse navigation program. Um, and we also did a lot of cancer prevention education in the community and community outreach. And, um, and then we helped to establish nurse navigation standards and programs throughout the entire healthcare system. And so we started with no program. So we weren't serving anyone at the beginning. And when I left after about uh, 10 or 11 years, we were, you know, ended up being able to help thousands of people every year. And we were about 75% grant funded. Um, in our case, we couldn't really track the outcomes like Western medicine likes to. Um, we did have a couple of um, approved research projects. So we got, you know, empirical data that way, but we couldn't prove in numbers that support groups or equine therapy helped in terms of the clinical progression or cure of cancer um, or, you know, anything like that. But we did have testimonials from uh, many people and we did track numbers. Um, we tracked um, the number of people who attended every single offering, but there were a million other things that we tracked. So we had data for all of it. And in our case, grant funders were satisfied with these metrics. And, and it really did sometimes feel like bean counting. And it certainly felt arduous at times. And also getting my staff to track all of the data required, um, it, it meant that we had to build that tracking into our workflows. But without that data that we had, we couldn't have gotten or maintained our funding. And more importantly, we couldn't have adjusted our efforts. So being able to look at our actions from a data standpoint allowed for us to advocate for whatever we needed, you know, more staffing, different services, um, how to market and advertise our services better. Um, and so I just want to emphasize that for a minute, that the data allowed us to advocate for what we needed. Um, if I were to apply my learning to something like opioids, um, I would still fiercely track my process, but then I could also use clinical outcome data, you know, like how many people were hospitalized due to overdoses and how many deaths occurred. So measuring clinical outcomes would be possible in that case. But my point of all this really is to track both the process and the outcome whenever possible. So this was uh, the High Country News. This was a 2020 article, and it highlighted the problem with indigenous data collection and reporting in the US. 
Um, agencies often misclassify people by race or they actually don't track by race at all. But more importantly, well, maybe not more importantly, but there's a difference between race and tribal affiliation, of course. So saying that you're an American Indian or Alaskan native doesn't say anything about what tribe you're from or what specific sovereign tribe you're from, um, which means there's just not proper representation in the data. So um, tracking race doesn't reflect tribal affiliation, um, but we also know that native people are not homogenous. Um, so you know what's happening for one tribe or one group of people in a tribe is not necessarily true for all other tribes. So we have to generalize with caution. Uh, in this article, Abigail Echo Hawk said, by not collecting this information and racially misclassifying data, you're making native people and other people of color absolutely invisible. So the data is an inaccurate because of this misrepresentation, but then also due to the complexity of our institutions reporting mechanisms, by the time the data does get to those people who need it, it can be further stripped away of you know, nuance or just complete information. And then on the other side, oftentimes institutions are not willing to share data with tribes at all, um, or someone at an institution puts a great sharing relationship in place, but then they leave and, that be, and then the data sharing agreements weren't formalized. So then the tribe has to start all over building a new relationship, which takes time and may or may not have the same results. So you might not get the same um, great sharing agreement. Um, there are two issues with data privacy. The first is that sometimes um, community projects and institutions really do have the right intention. For the people that they serve, um, they choose not to collect data that might be helpful, but that's to either protect the recipient's privacy or perhaps um, allow them to be more willing to get help from those services. So sometimes, like if you think of, you know, food banks or I don't know, homeless services, there might be um, reasons why if the recipient feels like they have to share that they actually won't take the services. And so um, if a community agency sees that asking for demographic information prevents people from taking those services, it, it feels right to allow for anonymity, but it's tricky because you really need the data, again, for all the reasons that we've already talked about. Um, but then on the flip side, institutions have in the past collected information, but then not respected patient or recipient privacy and shared that information that violates, you know, at minimum, it violates HIPAA and FERPA. But more than that, it's an affront to the people whose information has been shared. And of course, that increases the mistrust that a lot of um, Native people um, or people of color in general have for um, the, these institutions. Um, I do want to say that a lot of institutions are very well intended and there's wonderful people working for them. So it's just really about creating change and um, education about the way that classification happens. Um, but the bottom line is that the native data provided by non-native agencies should be used, but it should be used with perspective. And then we need to advocate for just a better state of things. So there is a movement to disaggregate data um, to make it useful and respectful. And in the name of time, I'm not really gonna go into that, except that I am gonna read this quote because I think it, it summarizes it pretty well. So it says, to address these inequities and discrimination, healthcare and public health systems need to change how they collect, analyze, and report data. The five broad categories in which data is currently and primarily collected, Black, White, American Indian, Alaska Native, Latinx, and Asian American Pacific Islander. These categories both ignore entire populations and thus perpetuate systemic injustices and treat as monolithic the other demographic characteristics that can be more fully understood by further disaggregation, such as by socioeconomic level, age, and geography. So the process of this disaggregation of data is really a part of decolonizing data and our data structures in general perpetuate structural racism. And so I love this quote again by Abigail Echo Hawk and it says, decolonizing data means that the community itself is the one determining what is the information they want us to gather. Why are we gathering it? 
who's interpreting it? And are we interpreting it in a way that truly serves our communities? Decolonizing data is about controlling our own story and making decisions based on what is best for our people. This hasn't been done in data before, and that's what's shifting and changing. So we wanna make sure that we're asking the right questions even, and those should come from, or you know, at least be validated by individual communities. And I recommend, I put the links to these articles on, on every single one of these slides, and I definitely recommend following them and reading them because the people being interviewed and the authors say all of this way better than I can, but I do think it's really um, important information to share. So there is this movement to disaggregate um, and there are resources and um, a lot of work is being done. And again, I'm not going to go into this too much, but this is just an example. The Urban, Urban Indian Health Institute put out a best practices for American Indian and Alaska Native data collection. And you can follow this later, but this slide is meant to show you that a lot of work is being done on this. I also want to recommend a specific podcast episode. This is the HPP podcast um, and Valerie, Dr. Valerie Bluebird Jernigan and then Native researcher Cynthia Begay, they talk about the following points with a lot of grace and clarity. Basically, they explain that Western work and thus Western data is siloed. So diseases and work and funding is broken down by disease. And so diabetes is separate from cancer, is separate from cardiovascular disease, the way that it's structured. And it's pretty transactional in nature, like provide this intervention and measure these specific results, which really don't describe the whole picture. And the um, Cynthia Begay and, and Dr. Jernigan also explain um, that native thinking and feeling is not siloed and that everything is interconnected and everything is about relationship, not transaction. So Western data just in and of itself isn't shaped in a way that resonates with native ways of being, yet this is where our funding comes from and kind of the container in which a lot of activity has to happen. So we do need Western data because we are interacting with the system, but I think it's working within the system while also working to transcend and transform. Um, I was fantasizing that we would have like five more hours of this and we could talk about what it would take to transcend and transform. <laughs> but I'll leave this slide by just saying, you know, I think naming the problem and the desire to work out of it, I, I think is a, a powerful thing at least, but um, there's so much to explore around that. So I put this slide in here probably for me more than you all um, as a reminder that there are really amazing people at all levels who are working to help with our data problem. So we should feel hopeful about the future um, and also be ready to advocate for change as we gather our data. Okay, so now I'm gonna switch over to a few points about data, data collection and tracking. Um, so, as you all know, there are a couple types of data. The first is quantitative. So these are numbers and rates and the kind of data that statistical analysis is performed on. And these data are important and, and useful. And they're also usually valued um, the most highly in the dominant US culture. And so this is considered that empirical data. It contains large data sets and allows for statistical analysis and kind of an eagle-eyed view. Qualitative research is also very important and it's becoming more acknowledged. And for a long time, it, it really wasn't taken seriously and it wasn't considered as rigorous um, you know, or as uh, scientific as quantitative research. It uses smaller numbers of people and seeks to understand the live, lived experience of participants. So um, the researchers take conversations um, and interviews and writing and it's transcribed and then coded into themes. And the themes are reported along with the actual words of respondents. And so I love this because it comes with the idea that one voice is just as important as many. So it's like the loudest voice doesn't necessarily get, you know, the most attention. And it can be really useful and is also a place where cultural values and, and information can be given space and um, can be heard more deeply. So we need both kinds of data. We need quantitative and qualitative. Um, and I noticed this, especially when reporting on grants or applying for them, that you really do need both. You need the numbers and the story. 
I also wanted to highlight uh, community-based participatory research and to recommend these three podcasts. Again, these are the HPP podcasts that I just love. Um, they address community-based participatory research um, and also the, the, the necessity of valuing Native perspective in research. Um, so CBPR is about data being dictated, designed, collected, and interpreted by communities so that the results are culturally relevant and useful. Um, and it engages the community to help with community building. Um, this type of research is becoming more and more mainstream. And I think as I have gone through my master's program and you know really engaged with it, I, I said to a colleague the other day, like, so apparently anybody who's anybody is now doing CBPR. So it's kind of like the place to be right now. Okay, so in terms of, uh, using external data resources. The only thing that I know how to do is to diligently network and collaborate and partner and be in genuine relationship with external sources of help. I also think that Native researchers in academia can be of help. So academia is generally considered its own tower, so to speak. But I know that in my time working with the tribe, I reached out to a Native researcher, Cynthia Begay, who I just highlighted earlier. Um, she's a total academic and she was more than happy to help me and has such amazing perspective and she's native herself, but then she's also been immersed in the world of academia. Um, I think that native researchers could come to presentations like this and talk and share and you know dialogue. And I think that there is great power in building the bridge between acad uh, academia and everyday work, um, because you know we know that academia often creates results that then drive funding. So I think it could be a, a good area of strength. And we're gonna share in a minute about some recent data collection efforts of the Yurok tribe. And I think the more that groups or you know, other tribes can come onto conversations like this and share their successes and trials and tribulations with each other, the better we'll, we'll all do. The Yurok tribe um, relies on a lot of external institutions and organizations. Um, there are, you all probably know this, but there all are 12 tribal epidemiological centers in the US and we use the one in California and they've been great. Um, we are a rural tribe. So the California Rural Indian Health Board is an excellent partner. Um, the United Indian Health Services provides medical care to our members. So they're an important and helpful partner. Um, and there are other local, county, national, and regional data sources all over the country. Um, and I mentioned this earlier, but it's really important to formalize data sharing agreements so that they stay in place regardless of the individual people doing the work. Um, and all this is to say that we know that this external data and these external partnerships often come with the limitations that we've already talked about. Um, but it is still useful and we consider it important. And I think it's about casting your net wide and using all available resources. Um, my advice about internal data and in internal resources is actually mostly from my non-tribal work in healthcare, but I, I think it can apply here. So building collaboration into organizational structures and into the work cultures is really important. And it's about coming together at a regularly scheduled chunk of time for leaders to share the overview of what they're working on and to make it a point to understand what data everybody has, um, at what everybody has access to or is spending resources to track. So this helps decrease duplicative efforts. So your organization doesn't become like an octopus where there's like eight arms doing things and no arm is aware of the other, <laughs> the other arms activities. Um, and sharing what's going on in each department, including data, builds organizational wisdom and knowledge and understanding of goals. And of course, it's, it's wonderful for teamwork and cooperation. So if data is truly a resource, like I mentioned earlier, we should treat it like we do other resources with the same amount of space allotted for it. Um, data collection, tracking, and reporting should be built into workflows and responsibilities. And it means setting up data systems where data is organized and well-maintained. Um, and this means that there has to be resources for data infrastructure. Um, and I know from personal experience in my previous career that once I showed my staff how the data tracking helped, um, it helped our patients, it helped our program, and then us because we could stay employed, <laughs> you know, if the program was going well. 
um, that helped them feel invested in taking the time to do the data collection and the data tracking. And so I guess you could say it was, you know, bean counting with a purpose. <laughs> um, and then there's another thing that I was talking with Daniel recently, and he really reified. Um, but I've found that having multi multidisciplinary teams adds so much power to the data work specifically. And then, of course, working interdepartmentally. I mean, this is all about collaboration, but it can often be a great way to make work more efficient and build a bigger sense of team. Um, I do want to acknowledge the pull between limited staff and resources, and it's really hard to provide services to tribal members and then also do all of the data tracking, especially if the diligent data tracking hasn't been done before. So it's something that that we all have to work through. And, um, you know, I think it, we can celebrate our progress rather than, you know, looking at the distance that we still have to go. OK, in terms of funding. Obviously, if we can all get more creative um, and add data collection and tracking into our current um, and future employment structures and current budgets, that would be best. Um, but we know that resources can be scarce. And so um, I'm going to, we'll talk about this in a minute. Um, actually, Danielle's going to talk about it. But we did get a supplemental grant from the National Institute of Health to help document some of our data collection process and thinking. The Yurok tribe has also used AmeriCorps VISTAs, um, like Daniel was a VISTA. I'm an intern, um, and VISTAs and interns are either free or very minimal, um, you know, a, a very minimal cost. So that could be some, some creative funding. Um, other ideas include partnering with higher education to help with research and data collection, and also creating community-based participatory research projects. This does take a lot of time and thoughtfulness and, of course, resources, but I think that the return on investment in that is, is pretty great. I think this is a no-duh statement, but to conclude um, this first part of my presentation, um, it's just this summary on the right-hand side that we need culturally relevant, useful data coming from a sustainable and funded data infrastructure. And I think that is kind of makes me chuckle because it's like, how do we get there? Um, but I think framing it in that way and being able to name it and visualize it is a way that helps us get closer to it. And it's my belief that tribes must use whatever external data is helpful to them and also push for better data quality in general at that higher level. But in the meantime, I, I think that we have to collect our own data. So the last thing I'm gonna say for this part is that we can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And I mentioned this just a minute ago, but I think it is about making progress and being careful not to forget and to celebrate and connect around what can and is achieved rather than um, how much further we have to go. So I'm gonna um, just break here for a minute. Um, we can just keep right, keep right on going. Um, or if we wanna talk for five minutes, um, I have about the rest of the presentation is about 25 more minutes. So how are you all feeling? Do you wanna chat for a minute or just keep going? Lizzie, can we ask questions? Absolutely. And um, Justine and Shirley and Parker, I maybe we'll leave it up to you all to, um, I, don't, I have no idea how we're doing with time. So um, if we want to set five minutes, 10 minutes, um, something like that. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yep. And hold on, let me turn on my video so that I can. Yeah. With you all. <laughs> thanks. Let's do, let's do five minutes. And yes, Becky, let's do questions. And also, if you want to put things in chat, Shirley and I will be following along with that, but let's do five or six minutes now of questions. And then we'll go on with the rest of the, of, of the, of the presentation. Um, Lizzie, what would be your dream or goal um, to see for the desegregating of data? What would be a recommendation? You know, you had shared at the beginning our current process that we have in place of desegregating with black, white, American Indian, Native, Alaska Native, not being really efficient and effective. What would you recommend if you could in your dream? 
Okay, well, you know, and then that always goes with the caveat of like, how is this ever going to be possible? But I'll just speak it because, you know, you never know. But I know in our area, you know, um, we have a lot of tribes in California. And so um, to have um, hospitals, county agencies, um, I actually, because I'm so new with the tribe, I don't know if United Indian Health tracks specific tribes, but um, the Yurok tribe is the largest tribe in, in California, and it would be really nice to understand the health outcomes of people from the Yurok tribe. I mean, it's what we have to do right now is compromise and say, okay, well, we know um, Native Americans in um, Humboldt and Del Norte counties have these outcomes, but that doesn't separate all of the tribes that are up there. So it's really asking about um, specific tribal affiliation. Um, and then also, you know, a lot of times, like, and if you think about it, I mean, the ERs make a good decision. Like, you're not going to be like, nope, we can't treat this patient until we correctly classify your race. Right. I mean, we don't want anyone to do that, but if, if healthcare organizations and county institutions understood the importance of classifying correctly, or people make assumptions, like, if you don't look totally white, well, my husband looks totally white and he's Yurok. So he would easily be, be misclass. He looks like a Scandinavian, but he's not. He's just turned out looking the way that he looks. Um, so if institutions had training about why it matters to classify correctly, not only race, that top level aggregated level, but then tribal affiliations, and then also it's getting into the social determinants of health so that the data is just more useful. Thank you. Yep, and Holly is on the call. Um, she's the public health officer and she may have more nuanced um, opinion. So I don't wanna call you out Holly, but if you, if you feel, um, if you have thoughts, feel free to hop, hop on or Daniel. Actually, you know what? I see. I see Lori Nesbitt here, and uh, I know. I know it says Daniel Norton Luna on her on her computer or on her screen. But uh, Lori, just, why don't you take it away? It, yeah, I I'm like itching. Yeah, you you said it. <laughs> you said you said it correctly, and um, we have had conversations with uh, the technical people that that would be easy to just do Native American if they mark Native American and with this area are which affiliation are you and it's it's even as easy as if they mark your rock then hand over a piece of paper and say your 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 rock tribe has several different um, resources for you if you want to and it's up to the up to the person to carry on if they want more resources especially with coming out of ER and substance abuse. Um, and, and even with the, even with the courts, um, we have different resources for them to um, carry on their, their challenges that they have, they have no idea what they've been asked to do. That's great. And I see that a question has come um, on the chat around examples of data collection tools and agreements. And my uh, my sense is that we're going to get that sort of into that in this next section. Is, am I right about that? Yes, yes, we great. will get into that. And then maybe we can revisit that question and maybe Lori and Holly can also chime in with that. Um, you know, afterwards, after we've given the, the next half of the presentation. Yeah. That's great, super. Okay. So I think we're ready to move on. Okay, great. Thanks. Right, okay. So, oh, hold on for a second. Let me see if I can, there we go, okay. Oh, hold on, let me minimize so I can see the screen also. Okay. So um, the Yurok tribe is located in Northern California, and it's really interesting because it spans across two counties and the service area of the tribe is pretty geographically distributed. And so some tribal members live in the biggest city around, which is Eureka, while others live in tiny towns with windy dirt roads. And then people live, you know, in places in between. 
So it is the largest tribe in California and it has about 6,500 registered members. Um, and then if you wanna find out more about the tribe, you can go to yurokttribe.org. Um, we are gonna talk, talk about two different recent data collection efforts of our wellness coalition and our public health office. And, but we wanted to say that there is other data collection happening in other parts of the tribe. So we're not representing the tribe, you know, holistically. Um, and then I also, Holly, um, when we were talking, she said, you know, I think it's important to describe this kind of as a condition that for years, we really have been more focused on providing member services and less about data. And it's only recently, like since in the last five, you know, five years or so, um, and even more so it's been um, accelerating over the last few years that we've really started working on our data infrastructure. So we're taking action and we're learning and adjusting and taking more action. And, um, and so just, again, it's what I said at the very beginning that we're not coming on here as experts. It's more to share what our experience and learning is. And so um, Daniel, I will pass it over to you now if you're ready um, and I will forward the slide. Right. Good morning, everyone. Um, before I start, I would like to just kind of introduce myself. Ayakui Neknau Daniel Norton Luna. And I'm actually originally from Southern California in the Coachella Valley. Um, and I came to the Yurok tribe about three years ago as an AmeriCorps Vista, uh, as Lizzie had mentioned. And after my year long service term, I became a um, an employee with the tribe and I work under the tribal court and I continue to work with uh, the project that I had sort of been volunteering with originally and um, I'm going to tell you a lot about that project right now and kind of uh, the work that's been done over the over the time that I've been here and just kind of like how Lizzie was saying you know she's still learning about all of the data collection efforts in the Yurok tribe uh, I know I've been here a little bit longer, but I am very much still learning <laughs> about all of the, those uh, uh, things as well. And so um, I will defer kind of questions that are beyond my scope of knowledge, probably to Lori Nesbitt, um, if you guys have any of those. And Lori's here on the call as well. So uh, with no further ado, I will continue. So before I talk about how the Yurok Tribe Wellness Coalition um, gathers data, I wanna share our coalition's story. Along with many communities across the U.S., the opioid epidemic had been escalating for decades into a public health emergency for the Yurok tribe. In 2017, there were very high rates of opioid prescriptions in our community, but the effects of the opioid epidemic were severely harming our families. We saw increased rates of opioid overdoses, child maltreatment, and suicide. The looming threat of fentanyl making its way into the street drug supply heightened the stakes of responding inappropriately. In early 2018, the Yurok Justice Advisory Board, composed of many tribal department directors and the chief judge of the Yurok Tribal Court, approached our tribal council with the need to develop a Yurok Tribal Action Plan specifically to address the substance use crisis. By the end of the year, we connected with two statewide organizations that helped us organize and find resources for our efforts. The first organization was the California Rural Indian Health Board, or CRIB, whose tribal local opioid coalition grant provided clear direction of what we needed to do to build momentum for our coalition and help us stay on track. The second organization was the California Opioid Safety Network, which is now the California Overdose Prevention Network. Through their accelerator program, our coalition received AmeriCorps Volunteers in Service to America, or VISTAs, and access to a variety of opioid coalition resources for strategic planning. So we'll go to the next slide. One of our first steps in working with the tribal action plan was to learn how ready our Yurok community was to address substance use. We wouldn't be able to take effective action without knowing what kind of action is actually needed. 
So we use a tool called the Community Readiness Assessment as developed by the Tri-Ethnic Center at Colorado State University. And by June 2019, the tribe had their first VISTA helping with this work. CRIB's timeline expected a complete community readiness assessment report by the end of the month. And we hadn't even started. <laughs> so our VISTA really hit the ground running. She teamed up with a wellness court case manager and interviewed wellness court participants in our first community readiness assessment. The process was still understaffed and hurried. It was quick and dirty, but it was a very magnificent start. The result of our first assessment was so, so valuable. In a nutshell, the report showed our community was not that ready to act to address the substance issues. These results on one hand frustrated some of our coalition partners who had been already working on the issue because this meant their actions weren't as effective as they thought. A lesson we learned here is that it's sometimes hard to be open to the results our data creates because it can tell us things we don't expect. However, in our case, we found it better to accept these results so we could try a different approach with efforts more appropriately matched towards our community's readiness. In addition, AmeriCorps VISTAs began to participate in other community coalition meetings going on throughout Humboldt and Delmore counties on behalf of our team. By plugging into this network of tribal and non-tribal community leaders addressing the opioid crisis, we learned about what other resources and specifically data resources already existed. Furthermore, connection to those other groups helped us develop our own coalition structure. In the summer of 2020, we used the California Overdose Prevention Network's Opioid Safety Strategic Planning, a toolkit for local coalitions, to set up three strategic planning workshops where we decided as a coalition to establish work groups focused on three areas, data, outreach, and a long-term activity created, uh, created to build a wellness village for people in recovery. With this direction in 2021, the data work group focused on two main projects, a Yurok youth community readiness assessment about substance use in their community and a larger Yurok data project. The Yurok Data Project was an effort to help our group build a long-term plan to get the data we needed to help our Yurok tribal community, our Yurok tribal members effectively. Our work group designed and conducted key informant interviews with six external partners and five Yurok tribe departments to learn about existing Yurok specific data, data collection efforts, and opportunities around sharing that information. We interviewed the people we identified as data gatekeepers in each organization, and we asked them for about 30 to 45 minutes of their time and permission to record the interview. These conversations were extremely informative, but turning them into some sort of publishable report seemed pretty daunting for many of us who were inexperienced in data analysis. With the additional help of a small National Indian Health Board grant, as Lizzie had mentioned before, we were able to hire a analyst and tribal member, Dr. Blythe K. George, to complete this step for us and polish off the project in a good way. The lesson we learned in this project is that when we found ourselves sort of out of our depths, it was extremely helpful to call on help through those networks supporting us to help us make sense of what our next best step would be. And so after presenting our second community readiness assessment to the Yurok Tribal Council, we received a data request to gather perspective more broadly from the tribal membership. All our previous projects used key informant interviewing methods to gather information. So it was that qualitative type data that Lizzie was talking about. The nice thing about key informant interviewing is that the sample size is usually pretty small, around six to 10 people total. So it usually takes less resources than surveying hundreds or even thousands of people. Nevertheless, as the data re 
work group revisited its portion of the tribal action plan last summer, we decided to take on the survey poll project. This project is still under works, so I'll tell you a little bit how we are organizing it and then pass it back to Lizzie. I will just start by saying this is the first time any of our team members have organized a survey of this nature, scale, and rigor, and we are learning on our past experiences with other data projects, our limited levels of training in college, and what we found uh, through internet searches to inform our process. Uh, we began with conversations inside the data work group and then reviewed the with the coalition to decide on the survey's theme. Then we designed questions. We searched online for previous surveys of the same theme conducted in other communities to see how they worded those questions. Then we added the questions we liked and included some of our own. We want the data to be relatively easy to analyze, so we decided to have people answer most questions by scoring statements on a scale of 1 to 10, thus kind of making this more of a quantitative uh, data for us. Our first draft of the survey had about 13 questions. Then those were whittled down to 10 questions. Last month, uh, we had three AmeriCorps VISTAs serving with our coalition uh, make 70 calls to test the questions for clarity, test the script and the process that we set up. And from that test, the script was refined and now the poll is only nine questions. We removed any questions that were sort of too complicated or out of scope. So we're talking about making many, many more calls. And just like any other gathering activity, we don't wanna take more than we need. The survey needs to be efficient relatively uniform and respectful, respectful of people's time and respectful of the information we're gathering. So our callers will be reading and filling out the survey on Microsoft Forms. This platform is similar to Google Forms, which we have also used before. We set up a first page of the form where we will enter the respondent's information before we even dial. Then when we call, we keep track of call information as well. If they don't answer, we set the form to keep the data entry, but automatically end, so not go through the questions. And when they answer, we read through the script. At the end, the caller enters their name and can add any notes, like if they have personal connections to the participant or if they deviated from the script. We are currently establishing a percentage of responses to receive from each voting district of the tribe. And we estimate somewhere around 700. Depending on the number of people we get a hold of, we will likely call three or four times that many people. So far, we have learned this is also a time consuming process and it helps immensely when we have to help to split up the number of calls made by any one person. As with all other projects discussed, we have a clear idea of how we want to use the data gathered. If we want, we can re-administer the same survey in the future to compare results and measure progress. This kind of information is good for us to review and also to report in our grant projects. Lastly, even if the same staff are not around to administer the survey a second time, we are keeping track of the tools we make so whoever follows us can get a head start where we left off. And with that, I will hand it over to Lizzie. Thank you so much, Daniel. And I'm just, um, I wanted to put a bookmark, what you, one thing that you said really, um, I wanna say more about it, but I won't say it, but it's about having a, a data collection and evaluation plan. So maybe if Justine and Shirley can, Remind me that I have a thought. So oh, um, the Wellness Coalition, oh, and I'm just trying to forward this slide. Hold on. Okay, so the Wellness Coalition and their data group um, has been hard at work in um, the way that Daniel just explained um, over the past number of years. And in early 2021, the Yurok tribe actually opened its own public health office, mostly in response to COVID. And 
responding to COVID and becoming established as its own office within the tribe is really all the public health office could do for its first six months or so. Um, and like Daniel described with the AmeriCorps Vistas, when I approached Holly, again, who's on the call, she's the leader of our public health office in September of last year, um, about my master's internship, she was able to bring me on um, to help with some of her next steps. And so now that the department has a little bit of time under its belt and you know it's adopted its systems around COVID responses and it's hired staff and that sort of thing, she now needed to determine what one or two other health issues besides COVID the department should focus on over the next few years. Um, the office will be starting a formal community needs assessment process, but in the meantime, you know, what is the quick pulse on what health issues are most important to the Europe community? Um, because obviously the public health office um, shouldn't choose to focus on anything unless it's meaningful to the people that it's helping. Um, but in terms of me helping, so first of all, I live pretty far away from the tribe. And even though my husband and son are Yurok, I'm not part of the tribe. Um, and given those constraints, but also, um, you know, the time, the time sensitivity of it, um, what could we do with the resources that we had and how could we find out relatively quickly what the community would want the public health office to focus on. So we decided to take a two pronged approach. Uh, we decided to send a survey to all tribal employees and there are about 400 employees, depending on the season. And we wanted to conduct three focus groups, um, one for elders, one for teens, and one for adults. Um, so the employee survey was chosen because we wanted results that were easy to get and to count. And all tribal employees have access to email. And if they're asked to complete the survey as a part of their job or their work day, we thought we would be more likely to get responses. Um, we had to acknowledge the limitations of this. We were going to be leaving out young people, retired people, you know, many elders who are one of the most important groups of the tribe. Um, there are also lots of places in our service area on the reservation where, you know, people don't have internet. So basically, many voices would not be heard in taking this quick pulse. But again, it was the best that we could do with the time and the resources that we had. And because many tribal mem uh, employees are also tribal members, we thought that this solution was basically good enough for where we were. We also wanted to essentially have them vote on the important health issues, but then we also wanted to hear free form responses to get more depth. And um, for the voting portion, we needed basically like a menu of options for people to choose from. But then the question was, how do we come up with a menu that is relevant to the community? Because we don't want to just have Holly and Lizzie making up a list of things for people to vote on. So first I did a national literature review, um, knowing that national and aggregated data has all the limitations that we've discussed. Um, and this is a screenshot of my presentation um, to the tribe. And um, none of this information is going to be a surprise to any of you, so I'm not going to go over it in detail. But this was the starting list of issues to take to people to create our quote unquote real list um, for tribal employees to vote on as the biggest health problem. So I had these um, nine issues that I then took out. So um, uh, I took that list to multiple key informant interviews, our, the Wellness Coalition and Data Group that Daniel talked about, and my Yurok Tribe co-workers, and I also read all of the Yurok Tribal documentation that people would give me. Um, and I have to say that creating this menu for people to vote on was the most time-consuming part of the whole process. So some issues were further differentiated, um, like people determined that they wanted substance abuse um, so you can see on the previous slide, substance abuse is its own issue. But with um, the, everyone that we talked to, they decided that they wanted substance abuse to actually be differentiated between alcohol, fentanyl, general, and tobacco. And then there were um, items that were added, like uh, uh, smoke from wildfire and missing and murdered indigenous women was actually separated out from violence. So again, if you saw on the previous slide, violence was one of the nine issues, but they had separated. There were actually three sub menu options 
in violence and then missing and murdered indigenous women was a was an entirely separate item and then elder health and services and it was interesting because if you go to the previous slide you see at the very bottom of the right hand side it says other issues mentioned asthma and other respiratory diseases, flu, dental health, infant mortality, and child safety and health. And um, dental health and child and safety and health were added to our menu as well. Um, so, um, uh, so the point was to create this relevant list of choices uh, for people to see. And um, it resulted in a list of 27 items that were relevant to and, and described by the community themselves. So we created the actual survey using that menu that we had co-created, but also validated all of the actual survey questions with approximately eight additional people. And I'm just gonna, I'm minimizing, oops, sorry, I'm minimizing this so that I can see this, okay. So you'll see um, that the final questions, which don't include the demographic questions that we asked, which was about like whether they were a tribal member, whether they were a tribal employee, um, because we did end up sending them to the wellness coalition members and some of our district representatives, all of our district representatives. Um, so the first question was this menu. So it was, what are the top three issues that affected your family or community over the last year besides COVID? But all of the other questions were open field responses. What is the, the top health problem for you and your family or immediate community? And then what do you think is the one most important health problem that the entire Europe community faces? And then the rest of the questions were really about what you think the greatest strengths are, what does a healthy Yurok community mean to you? So kind of visualizing what health would mean and what can be done now to promote a healthy Yurok community. Um, and we, so the other thing that I just wanna throw in there is I'm sure a lot of you know that another problem with Western data is that it really looks at disease and problem states rather than resilience and strengths. So we did want to find out the problems, but we also wanted to, you know, talk about strengths and, um, and visualize health rather than, you know, focusing on all the things that are wrong. Um, and we knew that the top level question with the menu, that would be really easy to, um, to tally because people are just voting and it's just a simple tally versus the open field responses would take a, a little bit more to interpret. So we sent it out uh, via Microsoft Forms um, and uh, Holly emailed all the tribal members and also talked to the managers about getting people to respond within that week. And um, we ended up getting 130 responses, which I was really happy with. We also offered raffle prizes. So everybody who answered, if they wanted to, they could put their name in the bottom. So the, the survey was anonymous, but if they wanted to put their name at the bottom, we entered that into a raffle. And they were just, um, you know, modest prizes. Um, the biggest one was lunch for the department. Like if someone won that prize, their whole department would get lunch. Um, $25 gas card, a $25 grocery card, and a pair of earrings. Um, and then if, as usual, like tribal council members weren't eligible. Um, and so the prizes weren't grand, but they were incentives nonetheless. And I'm calling that out because incentives really help. Um, so from the responses that we received from the employee survey, and again, there were 130 of them, we were able to create graphs and charts that illustrated the results. Um, and we were able to compare how people rated, for instance, the top problems in their and their immediate community's life versus what their perception of the biggest problems of the whole tribe were, which I think is important um, in thinking about where we want to shine our flashlight in terms of, of the actions that we're going to take. Um, so for the open-ended questions, we performed both a quantitative and a qualitatively based analysis with um, both a tallying and coding of themes. Um, I did have to make analysis judgments, but I did um, validate them with a couple other people to make sure I was making the right assumptions or ones that we all felt were really reasonable. Because when you're interpreting data, you obviously don't want to, you want to accurately represent what people are saying, and you want to be really careful um, not to skew things um, from, you know, your own lens and perspective. There were two new categories that were created from the open-ended fields that were not on the menu that we had created, which was very helpful. Um, the two issues are wellness and healthcare, and I'm going to go through this. Um, and this is just kind of an example, both of 
this is sort of like a, a pseudo qualitative analysis. And I'm like hoping my qualitative methods professor, I don't know if I want her to see this or if I do and if she would be proud, but I'll just tell you what I did. Um, so, um, so, and, you know, depending on how formal you could get, you could partner with academic researchers and conduct a very rigorous study. Um, I was as rigorous as I could be, but I'm just, there's just, I have a lot of caveats to, to that. So the question, this is an example of the coding that I did for all of the open-ended questions. If the question was, what is the top health problem that you and your family, you and your family or immediate community face? Um, if somebody said my family is working on dental health right now, I would have coded that as dental. If somebody said obesity, I would have coded that as obesity. And when you're when you're doing this kind of analysis, you read through all of the answers before you start. You don't just stop at, start at the top and create these. You're you're reading for like a holistic understanding of what the answers are and what themes are coming up. If somebody said fentanyl use, I would have coded that as substance use. If somebody said, and these are you know all real responses that people gave, if somebody said mental health for the restrictions of COVID and when quarantined, public and family drugs and alcohol usage, I would have coded that as mental health, COVID and substance use. Now, if somebody said weight gains, not exercising and not eating healthy, becoming obese, I would have coded that as obesity. But as I read through all of the responses, there was a, a theme that was coming up that I ended up calling wellness. But what wellness encompasses is ideas around, you know, health, healthy, fresh food, food sovereignty, access to access to it all, um, and also native food and how that connects with the culture, you know, getting exercise, having a healthy lifestyle. So I, I created a new, um, a new code or a new category called wellness that got a lot of votes in the in the interpretation or in the analysis. So if somebody said currently facing dementia problems with my grandpa and the lack of services in our area, um, health care. So this was another thing, just like wellness, there was a theme throughout so many of the responses that talked about having access to the right health care, you know, the right quality health care when it was needed, appointment availability, having transportation to get there, that sort of thing. So I would have coded that as, as health care and elder services. Um, and so that's kind of how I ended up both tallying and then I created um, a lot of quotes in the presentation. So just as an example, like if somebody, one response was, so as far as what does a healthy Yurok community mean to you, I included a lot of the quotes. So elders being respected, young children having positive and cultural activities, mental health awareness for all, or somebody else said clean water environment, functioning ecosystems, traditional practices, food sovereignty and economic opportunities. Hey, we check means healthy self, healthy community, healthy species, healthy ecosystem, healthy tribe. So, um, this is, you know, providing quotes is a way to try to find balance between reporting um, a collective sense and, and um, frequency of answers versus letting individual voices be heard. Um, and so I did both quantify the open-ended fields as well as um, tried to do the best job at the qualitative analysis as I could. So our focus groups were small, um, and in an ideal world, they would have each had a couple more people. But again, we worked with the resources that we had. We did one for elders, one for teens, and two for adults. And um, each participant received a $25 Visa gift card, because again, incentives really help. <laughs> um, during the groups, the participants were able to confirm with me their list of the top health issues for the community. And then with the participants' permission, we recorded the groups for internal review. And so afterwards, I listened to them repeatedly. So I did lots of playing and pausing and rewinding and playing and pausing. And from the themes validated by them, as well as new insights that I gleaned from listening to the conversation so many times, I pulled out more direct quotes that focused on the themes. Um, and we were able to ask them what we couldn't ask on the employee survey regarding our question of what the public health office should focus on. We talked with them about, you know, should the public office health office um, choose an issue that 
the tribe is already working a lot on. Like Daniel described, the tribe has been working really hard on opioid use. Um, should the public health office kind of try to fill gaps that we might find in the work that we're doing there? Or should the public health office focus on a quote unquote new issue, like maybe diabetes? So of course, United Indian Health Service, our medical provider has done a lot of work with diabetes, but the tribe in and of itself hasn't had a focused effort. So where should we, should we focus on filling those gaps first or should we do like a new issue that's also important? Um, and so that was that was really interesting. And we asked the same questions for the elders and the adults, and then slightly different ones for the teens. We actually didn't ask the teens about old versus new issues because um, it kind of wasn't on their radar. Um, but we asked them about the biggest health issues and what what we thought that could be um, could be done to make things better. So um, yeah. So basically, as a summary. Um, Daniel presented his group's data collection effort, and for this, um, for our question, we did a, a literature review, both national and, um, you know, county and state, but also tribal literature review. Um, and then we did key informant interviews, we did group discussions, we sent out the tribal employee survey, and then we did the focus groups, and then we conducted analysis, an analysis, and we literally just presented the results to council last week. Um, so we're in the process of, um, you know, of processing, <laughs> of processing that. And so with that, I'm going to turn on my video. Um, that is the end of the information that I prepared to share. Um, we can either talk amongst ourselves or we could go into breakout rooms and I've created a couple of, um, you know, questions that you could talk about in breakout rooms. And then we would do a question and answer afterwards or, you know, a group discussion. So Justine and Shirley. Hmm. Yeah. Could I <laughs> make a suggestion? You. I don't know how yeah. the group feels, but we have about a little under 20 minutes left. So I don't know how much time they can spend in a breakout, breakout room. Um, so what I'm suggesting is we answer the questions and then just have a general discussion with everyone. I would agree, Shirley. And I think um, I think this is a chance for, for those of you on the call um, it, to, um, raise, to pitch in verbally if you have a question or if you have a comment. Um, and please use the chat. Shirley and I will be following along on the chat. I think that's a better use of our time than, than trying to get into breakout rooms and then come back. And I also wanted to leave it open for Lori um, uh, and Holly to, to comment. Um, Lori, you always, you always have, since you've been immersed in this data for so much, so much time, um, but I wanted to see if either of you have any comments. Before they do, could I interject something? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Uh, just wanted the people to know that I work with uh, Daniel and Laurie. I, we, they have received funding from the Office of Victims of Crimes grant, and they've done really awesome work. And they also are a part of the, you talked about the Wellness Coalition, and they have a monthly meeting. And it's a really good meeting, and it brings a, a lot of the local and the external people together and they use that time very wisely, in my opinion, because I've been to a number of those meetings and they're so good about sharing information and they provide uh, like reports, both written and oral reports on what their programs are doing in the community. And it just reflects the awesome work that uh, Yurok tribal folks are doing in their communities and they're collaborating together. And um, they also have a suicide prevention uh, team, uh, Bessie Shorty. She's so awesome. And, and they work together to, um, you know, do events and share um, resources with each other. They also have uh, designed a cultural library from the work that they've been doing. And then during uh, uh, COVID, they had barriers. And one of the ways that they went around the barriers was to have porch visits. Um, so I just wanted to 
interject that because I just think um, they don't talk enough about the awesome work that they do and, and that you all do there at Europe. Okay, thank you. I'm reading through the I'm reading through the chat and I um, the one that I'm that I was stuck on is the idea of non natives conducting surveys and I just want to say that like in my work with the tribe, you know, being non native. Um, it, I do think that there's. I think it can be challenging and I just, I just know that you know sometimes it's like i'm non native but. But I but I showed up and um, so it's just I think it's just about being really humble. Um, but I but I just wanted to call out that it has been a I've it's been on my radar very strongly to make sure that I'm not um, showing up in a way that a lot of non native people have showed up for a long time. Here 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 here. Well, OK, I want to comment on another issue. I have worked with Lori Daniel and before Daniel, um, Maya, um, Maya Washington, and they are the two, uh, they were primarily AmeriCorps uh, workers previously, and they have, to me, been very respectful toward the tribal people, and from everything I know, they do whatever they can to gather the information and to work with the families in the most respectful, humble way that I've observed. To me, it's not about the ethnicity or the race of the people who are doing the work. It's the heart and the spirit of the people who are doing this awesome work that's so needed in our communities. And I think um, if we can figure out a way to train our tribal members, that would be ideal as well. Thank you. Well, and I was going to add to that too, Shirley, and I, I think you would probably agree, Daniel, that one of the most important things, if you are going to include AmeriCorps, VISTA, and or AmeriCorps members, is to think about how you help them integrate into the, into the tribe and into the work, and never assume that they're going to know, uh, simply because they want to volunteer, that training of them and working with them and helping them work alongside um, those in the tribe is extremely important. I think what's been the strongest thing with the, the AmeriCorps for us is um, uh, as a team, there's just not one hanging out there mm -hmm. trying to survive this and integrate in the in the area that's so because they are sensitive and um, you know I think that Daniel um, when he first got there it was like he either was going to make it or not and I think that that one of the th strongest things that he did to help him is take on the language once he got so you know he's more fluent than me um, he put himself out there that he learned the language and can say I agree with with compassion, not just I agree. He 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 uses that expression of hello and I'm here. And then he he has phrases that I can't even say still and and um, taking those classes to utilize it in his daily life. So, um, you know, and language is is powerful. Mm -hmm. Lizzie, you wanted to say a little bit more, I think, about, I took some notes, you want to say a little bit more about data collection and the evaluation plan? I didn't want us to lose that. Oh, yeah, it was um, what Daniel said, it kind of sparked my thinking and just, you know, as far as building data infrastructure into your daily work, you know, when you're planning any kind of action or program, you know, planning evaluation, very, very um, conscientious evaluation. Like this is, this is how we're going to evaluate. This is the data that we need to collect. So we know how we're going to determine whether this effort is effective or not. And so just data is so powerful for being able to do that, but to not sometimes 
you're doing it ad hoc. Like, I mean, if you're, if you're just flying by the seat of your pants, sometimes you're like, well, what do we have? How do we prove it? But I mean, really to be rigorous and to be conscious about what data you're going to measure, how are you going to know that you've reached the results that you want to um, reach? That's part of data, the data planning. That's planning that happens up front, not at the end. Um, and that's just, that's not tribal related. It's, you know, any, any program that you implement. So that, that was my, my idea. Um, can a person build their own internal data infrastructure? Does a person need some type of credentials? So data infrastructure can be anything from an Excel spreadsheet to a fancy, expensive, um, you know, data product that you purchase. Um, I know in my previous career, um, you know, we helped a lot of patients, but there was you know, we couldn't use medical records um, for a number of reasons. Um, so we used, I used Excel for 11 years. Um, now you have to be meticulous. You have to know how to use it and how to, you can mess it up pretty easily. So you do have to have some sort of training, but um, you know, obviously it's better to have somebody with data expertise. You can also hire somebody to help you set up databases but um, if you think database feels like daunting to me, that word, but actually, if you think of it as Excel, mm -hmm. it's not as scary as it sounds. Um, and, and there are problems with Excel. So I'm not, I mean, you know, obviously if you have a system, um, it, it's better to have like a more robust system, but work with what, with what you have. Um, and as far as training available, I actually don't know. Well, yeah, Excel skills. I mean, again, like you could start with Excel and then, and you can do research. I mean, I know that we're at the tribe itself is looking at different data options. Um, so Serena, it looks like you have your hand up. Do you want to speak? Okay. I just read in the chat. Hi, my name is Serena and I am a uh, relapse recovery substance uh, alcohol counselor here at the American Indian Health Services or Chicago. And I do a lot of um, workshops with UIHI. And so I just saw the chat where they were asking for internal data infrastructure and they're doing workshops in regards to teaching people how to do grant writing, grant building, uh, qualitative, quantitative, uh, things of that nature. So if anybody's interested, just go to UIHI.org and uh, you'll be able to find workshops there. Uh, I know there's another one coming on um, May 8th for grant writing and also for, because uh, they show you how to do the structure and everything, give you ideas from, a, from an indigenous standpoint. So if anybody's interested, just wanted to share that. Thank you for the, the workshop and the webinar. It was beautiful. I learned a lot today. Thank you. Big glitch. Big glitch, exactly. Victoria? Yes. Hi. Did you want to say something? Oh, no. I was just saying, um, for this presentation, this is really terrific. Um, we're currently right now from scratch, from a complete unknown area, um, you know, doing focus groups, which we are calling listening sessions just for the cultural, you know, cultural uh, piece there. Um, and um, so we are very much starting from scratch with trying to pull resources, um, um, from RTA based on the receipt of the um, uh, uh, defined practices grant that we have right now and collecting data. And so I just want to say thank you because some of the things in here um, kind of just reiterated to me in referencing the resource that was provided to us on how to organize the data that we've collected so far from our group. And I was just wondering um, the way that you, you know, that you, um, how do you say it? Uh, I guess identified, identified the question and all that. If I'm, I'm seeing that there is no harm in not only pulling the data that you're needing to complete your project, 
but if you can pull other types of data and somehow categorize it, name it, that there's no harm in that because will that help, you know, does that, that may help in the future to help continue to formulate what other type of data collection yeah. you could do? I mean, is that, is that correct? I mean, is the line of thinking there okay? Tell me more about what you mean, like what pulling, so I mean, I definitely think that you can take data from all different sources to, mm -hmm. to like, you know, like if the image is like right in front of you, but knowing that it's like, like when we see, you know, it's things are coming in from all different directions to mm -hmm. form what we see. And so I think it's great to use as many different data sources to mm -hmm. paint a picture uh -huh. of what's happening and describe um, as possible. Um, as far as I think you're talking about the qualitative analysis that I was describing. Yeah. Yes. And I, I mean, I have to say, I'm like, I have done qualitative analysis in my in my previous career and then, you know, taken a great class on it. And so, um, I feel a little, um, out of my scope of saying like, definitely what you can do in really rigorous qualitative analysis. But I would say that, you know, the purpose of qualitative analysis is to listen and to accurately describe mm -hmm. what people's experience is and what they're saying. And so mm -hmm. that is the integrity that you're like, holding. And so I think I'd have to talk more with you about like what, what you mean by pulling from other sources, but yeah. And you can work. I mean, I know that qualitative analysis is a whole, um, area of, of expertise. Mm -hmm. And I bet there's people from like colleges. I mean, I bet you could like partner with partner with masters, um, in public health programs, for people to do inter just like me, you know, somebody yeah. who, and somebody who's like really an expert with quality. I'm not discrediting my, yeah. my work, but <laughs> I'm a little out of my, out of my scope. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, the sources I'm referring to is with the grant that we received, we have a TA, a technical assistance. And so they provided basically uh, a paper resource, you know, to get started in order to um, not only have we done our focus group and we have recordings of, of what was said based on each of the four questions that we presented in the group to the group, but um, a, a go by on and suggested go by on how to set it up, you know, like you were saying in a spreadsheet or something so that we can so that we can look at it. We're also currently um, looking for an evaluator, which we have a lead on that on our end. But I don't know, I just think uh, lately overall, having to, um, in learning about data collection and things like that for somebody who hasn't, you know, taken the classes or had the formal training, it's really, I find it interesting. I used to think it was boring. <laughs> but it's not. <laughs> and so I, I rather enjoy it. Um, I'm just hoping that I can, you know, do my best on this end because I am seeing the importance um, since getting into this for the Susanville Indian Rancheria, who is made up of four tribal groups, to be able to begin to start collecting their own data on in certain areas um, health in relation to our Lassen Indian Health Center facility here. And um, so we do have a couple of things pulled together or we're trying to get pulled together. One is that we have a MAP program. And so we are, and a syringe service program. So we were lucky enough to have a resource to help us pull together a, a a collection, a data collection, a spreadsheet that at the end of the year that'll give us maybe the graphs and the reports that we can pull. And then of course, for this cultural best practices, integrating and learning about the best practices deemed appropriate by the tribes here yeah. that we can integrate not only into the community, but to help support those who are recovering, you know, from um, uh, the drug misuse. That's great, Victoria. 
We're just trying. great. We're trying. It's so exciting. Of course you're trying. And the oh best part is that you're now excited about it. Well, yeah. It's no longer boring. That is great. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Yeah, thank you thank so you. much. Thank you. Daniel, you have your hand up. Yeah, so, you know, this is kind of piggybacking a little bit off of Victoria's question about um, kind of using data to to help efforts that are going on. And then also I, I saw Sean Milanovich's uh, question in the chat about collecting, like how to sort of include data already collected by non-tribal um, agents uh, in our communities and like how to integrate that. And so I'll give an example of one way that we do it, but I think that it's, it's a good thing to kind of just say, it definitely seems situational. Um, and Lori, feel free to chime in uh, with this example as well. Like one, one thing that we've done is we've worked to kind of figure out what information is being collected and then how we can actually use that to support our efforts within the tribe. And so an example is, uh, you know, we have a program, uh, a wellness program that has been you, uh, connecting, um, drug offenders, you know, in, in the criminal justice system who are booked in the Humboldt County Jail. And there's a list that the Humboldt County Jail puts out and it includes the names of the people who are now, who, who have recently been booked. Well, we have our tribal roles through our enrollment um, office mm -hmm. and we can go and take the Humboldt County booking and, and then go and you know, see, okay, who, which tribal members are those? Oh, we have a tribal member in there. We need to get in there so that we can see if we can enroll them in our program and, and do a diversion so that they go through tribal court versus the county court that has, you know, historically um, just kind of put them at a disadvantage and preferred to lock people up rather than actually treat them for, for their disease. And so that, you know, that's just an example of how we've been able to do that. I know we've got a person who's actually specifically working with murdered indigenous, um, missing yeah. and murdered indigenous people. And so they've got their own kind of data that they're trying to figure out what's being collected in the community so that they can also um, like do their own work with what information they have access to in the tribe as well. And so, a lot of it has been sort of piecemeal at this point. It's a it's a great hope that we would be able to end up in a situation where we'd have all the data and we'd be able to, you know, just easily identify. But that's currently not the situation because of a variety of reasons, mainly um, because these non-tribal agencies usually are not asking for tribal affiliation. It'd be so much easier if they did. Um, and that's probably a state thing that would that would change that or even a federal government thing that would end up changing that in a in a more uniform way across across the the state or the nation um and that's something that maybe we want to advocate for but uh in the <laughs> meantime this is kind of what we work with and how we do it yeah i i think we still kind of do the old school way it started out about eight years ago I started tracking what Daniel described for the domestic violence offenses. And um, you know, we were over, Yorox were overrepresented in, in uh, both counties with domestic violence. And so diversion, diversion and the opioids um, kind of fell in place with that. Now we're still um, keeping, we're doing the same type of uh, documentation um, weekly with the weekly logs for both counties. Um, uh, following the DUIs and, um, you know, marijuana use kind of falls underneath that. So, you know, our drug use is, is, you know, opiates and poly substances and, um, whatever is available by cost. And so, um, you know, we don't have a, we don't have a grant with DUIs yet, but I think that with us tracking what we do have over representation, um, in the both county jails and arrest, um, it, it will come into play. The other thing that I want to just say of overrepresentation of go back on the domestic violence. I was talking to the gal that's facilitating now because I oversee them, oversee her um, as a supervisor still. Um, 
in one men's class of 10, which is about the maximum amount that we can have in a class to do a, uh, uh, a good job with the individuals with the um, California um, 273.5 offense of domestic violence. Um, we have 10 men in there and there's only two that are non-native identified. So we have three, three um, African-Americans, I think there's two uh, Mexicans and and then the um, two three uh, Yorks, um, and so it was kind of I wanted her to document that the other day um, it, because uh, who's who's getting arrested and who is choosing to do the um, Yorok domestic class versus the other class that they have to pay to go to school to the college class. This is this is the ones that are choosing our class, um, which um, you know they're a lot better talkers than they are writers or readers. Uh, so um, I thought that that was pretty pretty good distinction that has happened in that cl cl this class, and we've had this class now for six years now. So um, I thought that was pretty pretty in uh, indicative of what is happening in Del Norte County. As for data, thank you, thank, thank you very you, much, Lori. Uh, yes. We're over the time, guys, so I think we need to wrap it up. <laughs> thank you, Yurok Tribe, um, Lizzie and Daniel and Lori and Holly for sharing all your information with us. It's really been helpful, and I think um, we uh, may need to do a follow up at some point <laughs> um, to talk about how to collect data and how to build data resource programs. So miigwech everybody and miigwech to Iowa, to all the Iowa folks and to Justine. Thank you. And don't forget to fill out your evaluation. You will get it. You will get the link in, um, in your follow-up email. And thank you everybody for coming and for the Yurok tribe for presenting your information so well. It's been really a moving and wonderful experience. We have another session on May 11th, where we're going to be talking about outreach and some of the ways in which you can use all of this data um, to get your story out there. So thank you. Have a great right. weekend, everybody. See you in May. Walk low. Thank, thank you. you for having us. Nagat. All right, later. Nagat, Megwich. Aloha. <laughs> <laughs> totally.